Welcome back into our class BI210 and we're going to pick up where we left off in our first half hour. We're going to pick this up now in our next half hour and I want to continue to look at the errors of interpretation and thank you for affording me the time to do so. And so we looked at point number one which is do not make a point at the price of proper interpretation. Do not drive a point okay, at the expense of proper interpretation. Do not impose a point on the text that is not there. Now, so you must not make the Bible illustrate your sermon or your thoughts. Did you hear what I just said? You must not make, I'm going to repeat this. You should not, you must not make the Bible illustrate your sermon or your thoughts. Okay? Be careful not to interpret the Bible at the price of its true meaning. Let it say, okay, let it say what it means to say. So I want to drive you now to the next point, number two. Avoid superficial interpretation avoid superficial interpretation. So many people, they just skim right over the top of the scriptures. And I hear this often. I hear it often. Listen, so let me drive you, let me give you an example. Let's draw attention to 1 Timothy chapter 5. So let's go back to 1 Timothy. Let me show you this. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, and let's look at um, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Now let's read it. Here's my second point. Avoid superficial interpretation. Avoid it. Let me give you an example. The elders who rule well, this is 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard hard at preaching and teaching. And I've heard this, I can't tell you how many times, okay? <clears throat> but as you study the Bible, okay, to learn what it says, don't be superficial. Stop that. Do not be superficial. Some people will say, well, I think this verse means, or I've actually heard Bible study people in, in, in home groups and in Bible studies in the church building say this, what does this verse mean to you? And it's just like, I have no more hair to pull, okay? And it drives me crazy because I hear, I hear preachers say this, doesn't matter what you think it means to you. What matters is what does God, what God says, and what He meant, it to, what He meant it to say to us. Listen, unfortunately, a lot of Bible studies are nothing but how would I say? They're nothing but a gathering, okay, of ignorance. It's the blind leading the blind. It's the ignorant teaching the ignorant to remain ignorant. Like, your opinion of what the Word says or what you think it says means nothing. What did God say? And so you have a lot of people that are sitting around mm -hmm, and they're telling what they don't know about what the verse is. Did you what I just said? They just sit around and everybody's talking about what they don't know about what the verse actually says. <coughs> and somehow... The group leader or the pastor or the teacher has no clue either. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm for Bible study, so don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying. No, no, you know, I get these text messages and I get these emails and, and people, you know, they're, they're just asking me, why did you say this? Why did you say that? Are you against this? Are you against, no, are you against that? No, 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 no. Misunder no, no don't misunderstand me here. Look. But somebody has to, listen to me, I'm not against Bible studies, but somebody has to actually study the Word. Somebody actually has to study the Word 
to find out what it really means. Somebody in this whole group has to study it. Mm -hmm. Then you can discuss the application. But the problem is that we go straight into an application and we have no clue what it's actually saying. So look at it. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 even tells us about elders. Elders who work hard at the word of God. This is what they're doing. So it's important not to be superficial. This is what we're told. Uh, never mind Brother Eddie's opinion. No, look, look at what he says. He says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. I got to tell you, at this stage of my life, it's frustrating to sit down and hear a preacher who has little to no training in the Word of God and just rail away on something and it's so superficial and I just got to swallow my tongue, swallow it and be quiet and be respectful. Okay? And it just drives me nuts. So now, so that's the second thing. Avoid superficial interpretation. Unfortunately, that's a big one in the church today. Third, do not spiritualize. Mm -hmm. So the first area that we mentioned is don't make a point at the price or at the expense of proper interpretation. Second, avoid superficial interpretation. And now we come to the third, do not, don't spiritualize. Let me give you an example. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, please. And let's read the first seven verses of Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 7. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the, and the other Mary came and, and, and came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, and for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Now, I want you to underline, underscore verse 2. Let's read it again. I want to really, I want to make an emphasis here. <clears throat> and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook off, shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I, have no, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here for he has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he had risen from the dead, and behold, he is going to ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Now, let me share two, two things about this. Okay? And I asked you to go back and read, read verse 2, right? In fact, let's do it again, third time. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Quite a number of years ago, <clears throat> and again, I'm one of those guys, I lose track of exactly when things happen. Okay? But I do remember, I do remember the incident. Okay? And there's two that I want to share with you. <clears throat> so a number of years ago, Dr. John MacArthur at the Shepherds Conference and at the Shepherd Conference, you know, at the main, <clears throat> they have these main uh, uh, teachings at, in the main hall, okay? And then we're broken down into workshops, into different workshops on different topics by different teachers. Well, <clears throat> in one of the workshops, okay, we were looking at exegesis and looking at breaking down the scriptures. Okay? And Dr. McCarthy walked into this particular workshop, okay, and during the Shepherd's Conference, and he shared this story. Okay, when he was a very, very young preacher first starting out. He said, the first sermon I have ever preached was a horrible sermon. Now, he got all of our attention. He got everybody's attention, okay? And he said, my text was, 
And the angel rolled the stone away. That was the title of his message. And the angel rolled the stone away. And he said, my sermon was rolling away the, rolling away the stones in your life. That was his sermon message. So he says, rolling away the stones in your life. Now, remember, I told you that this is the third point. Do not spiritualize. Okay? And he said that, he, and he said, I talked about the stones, he's about the stone of doubt. I talked about the stone of fear. And I talked about the stone of anger. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not what the verse is talking about. It's talking about a real stone. And he said, I made a horrific, a terrible allegory. Well, don't remember how many years after that. Don't remember exactly how many years after that. So I was in South Africa. Okay? And we were at a Bible conference. You know? And, and had, you know, there was the main speakers, and I was one of the main speakers one of the evening. And then in the daytime, we had workshops as well, okay? And, and in one of the workshops I had given, um, I was asked what assignments I would give ahead of time, okay? And so I gave certain assignments and certain verses, okay? And then each young pastor picked out uh, uh, the section of Scripture, and one of them picked up this exact section here in Matthew chapter, okay? Matthew, 20, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. And then he proceeded, he wailed away about rolling away the stones in your life. I just, I'm just standing there, I'm hearing him, okay? I don't know what expression I had on my face, I could not tell you. Um, but I'm listening to him and he talked about, okay, about the stones of doubt. He talked about the stones of fear. He talked about the stones of anger. In fact, he was really creative. He added like four or five more to this. And I just listened, okay? So when he got done, and I said, well, and I, then I had to comment after each mini sermon that was given. Okay? And I asked him, and I said, you know, I said, that's rather strange um, because I heard Okay, Dr. MacArthur, a number of years earlier, explained that that was his first sermon. And then he said, yes, that's exactly where I got it from. I heard that on an interview that he did, and I thought that was a great sermon. What? I said, you obviously didn't hear the whole sermon. He goes, the whole interview. He goes, no, I didn't have to. He just took off with it. Mm -hmm. Look. This happens all the time. Now, remember in the last class I mentioned to you that my wife and I went to church service and the preacher took out of Matthew chapter 2 and he said that the three gifts, you know, the gold, the myrrh, and, and the gold, the incense, and the myrrh, okay, represented three cultures. This happens all the time. People just spiritualize all, I mean, it's, they, they get out of thin air, I don't know where they get it from, but this happens all the time. And the worst thing is that you sit in the church and you hear all these people saying, Amen, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah. You could tell the people, you know, hey, you know, I just I just robbed your house while you're sitting here. Amen, hallelujah. They're just mindless. It's absolutely mindless. Okay. Well, let me give you another example. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. And let's go to Acts chapter 27. And let's look at, mm, let me find it for you. Give me a moment here. Acts chapter 27. Let's start in verse 27. Acts chapter 27. And let's look at verses 27. And let's go down to verse 32. Acts chapter 27, verse 27, down to verse 32. Let's read it. But when the 14th night came, when the 14th, 14th night came, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. 
They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little further on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship, this is verse 30, they had let down the ship's boat and into the sea and on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Well, so we just read verses 27 and 32, right? I want you to go back and look at verse 29 and underline verse 29, okay? Just make a, make a mental notation. I want, to, I want to repeat it again. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. Now, I hear it as another example of spiritualizing. Okay. These the, the examples are just innum they're innumerable. You just can't count them. Okay. So I once heard a sermon on they cast four anchors and wished for the day. That's the sermon. They cast okay four anchors and wished for the day, and they drew it out of verse twenty nine. That was the whole text. He read Acts chapter twenty seven verse twenty nine. Okay and proceeded to talk about the anchor of hope. And proceeded after that, talked about the anchor of faith. Okay? And it just went on and on. It was the anchor of this, the anchor of that, the anchor of this, and the anchor of that. So let me tell you, you know, and I'm listening to this, okay? So at the end of the sermon, I, I went to the preacher and introduced myself, and I said, you know, uh, please forgive me, guys, but, but, but those were not anchors of anything but metal. That was it. It was literally an anchor of metal. And you just finished spiritualizing this verse and you made it into anchors of hope, anchors of strength, anchors of courage, anchors of faith, anchors of perseverance. I mean, the guy just went on and on and, and the congregation was, amen, hallelujah, amen, praise you, Jesus. I was like, what? See, you know what you can call that? You can call that little Bo Peep. You can call that little Bo Peep because you don't need the Bible. You can just use anything. And that's apparently what they're doing when they get in the pulpit. Okay? You can even use little Bo Peep. Okay? Let me show you what I mean. Okay? Someone can get up and say, well, you know, little Bo Peep okay, has lost her sheep. All over the world, people are lost. Okay? They're lost. And you see, you don't need the Bible to, to explain that to people. And can't tell where to find them. And can't tell where to find them. And they'll come home and they'll come home. Well, then you tell this little tear-jerking story. You can tell this little tear-jerking story about some sinners who came home, wagging their tails behind them. Do you see what I mean? And this happens all the time. It's so easy to do. And a lot of people do it with the Old Testament, especially with the Old Testament. They turn it into this fairy book. Okay? And they make all kinds of crazy things happen. Do not, don't spiritualize the Bible. Get the right meaning. Get the right meaning, please. So these are three errors to avoid. Okay? Don't make a point at the price of proper interpretation. Don't make a point at the expense of proper interpretation. Avoid, secondly, avoid superficial interpretation. And third, do not spiritualize. Please don't do it. Now, so now we've looked at the errors of interpretation. In the time remaining, let's begin to look at the sources of interpretation. The sources of interpretation. Okay? Now, in order to properly 
uh, interpret the Bible, we'll have to bridge some gaps, okay? To do that, we'll have to examine four areas, okay? So what happens is, from when the Bible was written to where you and I are today, okay, there is this gap, okay? There's a gap in between, okay? When the Bible was written and where you and I are today. So we have to bridge the gap, right? That's what, you, that's what you're going to, going to have to do, which is the reason why you have to study, right? I, I'm just confused as to why so many preachers refuse to study. I don't get it. Friend, you know what you need to do if you don't want to study? You need to step back from the pulpit. You need to step down from the, from the platform. And you need to step out of the church, resign, and go sell newspapers. Because what you're doing is an injustice. Okay? So now, I want to look at the sources of interpretation. Okay, Now, the Bible has been around for many, many, many years. Okay? And part of it is... Part of it is for us as long, look, and part of it for, for has been around for as long as 4,000 years. That's a long time. 4,000 years, a long time, buddy. What do you think about it, okay? Now, how are we going to understand mm -hmm, what they are saying and the various circumstances in which they lived? This is the key question. Mm -hmm. Again, let, let me repeat the question. How are we going to understand what they were saying and the various circumstances in which they were living 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago? But more importantly, at least 2,000. From 4,000 to 2,000 years ago, the world was completely different. So, so I want to look at this. So, so we're going to have to bridge. We're going to have to bridge four gaps, four main gaps. Okay. We're going to be looking at the language, or the languages of that time. We'll be looking at the culture or cultures of that time. We'll be looking at the geography of that time, and we're going to be looking at the history of that time. You go. What's the big deal? It's a big deal. Okay? So we're going to have to bridge some gaps. Okay? So 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, but this is where we are today. So there's a huge gap. We're going to have to bridge it. Okay? Now, so the first one is the language. The language. Now, please, don't tell me that's not important. Please. No, I have to deal with students in 50 four countries around the world, 118 languages, innumerable dialects within those languages. Hmm? So, so don't please, please don't tell me language is not important because it is. Okay. Now, for my purposes and for your purposes in this particular class, okay, we speak English, and <clears throat> many of you. You gather in the groups, and I know, and I know this for a fact because I've I've been with you around the world. And so, what you guys, you take this teaching in the film, okay, in this video teaching, you you film, you you put it up in the, in a local church in a local sanctuary, okay. And a lot of pastors gather from different dialects, different languages, okay. And then we have an interpreter there who's interpreting what I'm saying, okay. So we speak English, but the Bible was written in the Hebrew and in the Greek. In the Hebrew and the Greek language, and they have, and and there are parts of it that is written in the Aramaic language, okay, which is very similar to the Hebrew language. Okay? So we have what we call a language gap. That's what we have is a language gap, okay, that must be bridged. Okay? Otherwise, we won't fully be able to understand the Scripture. Now, when I went to school. Okay. Um, back in the day, uh, it was kind of mandatory back then. And you know, you don't have to do this anymore. But <clears throat> back then, it was pretty much still mandatory um, that we had to learn Hebrew and we had to learn the Greek languages, and that was just that just drove us nuts. Okay. Now, at the time, I didn't appreciate it. I mean, I'm being frank with you. Okay. I really didn't appreciate it, but I do now today. Okay. 
Um, so let me give you an example. Let me open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. So the first bridge that we're attempting to get to, 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 to close the gap is language. Language. Okay? So for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, okay, the apostle Paul is speaking. And he says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ. Let's read this. Again, I'm going to read it out of the New American Standard Version and out of the King James Version. Now, you notice that I do that a lot is because, <clears throat> in my case personally, I preached for about 20 years. Um, yeah, yeah, that's about accurate. 20 years out of the King James Version of the Bible and probably, I would say, out of the 20 years, 15, the last 15 out of the 20 years, I was consistently having to look up the words in the King James Version and go back and look at them in the Hebrew language and look, go back and look at the Greek language. And I had to explain to the congregation, this is what that word means, but we translate it and we interpret it and we give it the meaning of postmodern English. Okay. Um, English, in the modern English, because now at that time we were still in the modern era, now we're in the postmodern era. But and so, and then I moved, and then about, I don't remember, 16, 17, 18 years ago, I began to preach out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible because it's a better translation, much closer to the original manuscripts, okay? So, one, oh, so, so you notice that I do that a lot. Now, the other two best comparative translations that exist, okay, would be the New King James Version of the Bible and the ESV, English Standard Version. So you have three great translations. You have uh, the New King James Version, you have the English Standard Version, and you have the New American Standard Version, okay? And now they're improving some of the other versions as well. So, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Now, in the New American Standard Version, it says this, let a man regard us in the manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In the King James Version, it says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, that sounds great, doesn't it? i, I got to admit that, right? Paul you're a minister of Christ, right? So when we think of the English word minister, okay, we think of a prime minister or the minister of defense, right? And that's, that's, so we look at somebody who who's, has a high position of authority, okay, and is leading a very large group of people making some of the most important decisions of their country. So in many countries you have prime ministers. Okay? In many countries within the government, the executive government, you have the ministers of the interior, the ministers of health, the ministers of defense and so forth, right? Well, and so we, really the word minister is an elevated thing. Okay? Um, I, I'm not sure, but I think somewhere, I think I spend probably about 70, 75% of my time um, doing word studies. This is where I'm looking at the actual words in the text I'm going to be teaching and preaching from. Okay? And so I spend a lot of time doing word studies. I want to understand exactly how the word is being used. Now, in the English language, we take the word minister, and really, when we think about a minister, that is an elevated term, right? It's an elevated thing, right? That's how we look at uh, at, um, at the word minister. Right? So now, <clears throat> it's a dignified term, right? But the Greek word for minister, because we're looking at the... New Testament, right? First Corinthians chapter four, verse one. Let a man regard us as a, as a, regard us as in this manner, as servants of God, as ministers of Christ. In the King James version, okay. But in the Greek, the word is uperetes. Uperetes. H u p r e e is h u p e r e t s. Uperetes. H u p e r e t s. Uperetes. 
And that word does not have this elevated meaning okay? in this text. Now, the English translation says minister okay, in the King James Word or servant. Okay? But we kind of, in the postmodern era, we go, oh, that's a servant of God. Okay? So we really have it as an elevated thing. But in the Greek language, that's not the word. Okay? It means in the Greek language, it's a third level galley slave on a ship. It's a third level galley slave on a ship. So what was a galley slave? On the big ships, those are the guys who were rowing. Right? Uperetes. Those were the ministers, the servants. So you could see that it's not a high elevated term. It's a low, low, way low term. Okay. So Paul said that when the record goes in, that when the record goes in for him, you know, when he dies, he's going to be looking up in heaven again. And he's saying is that let it be said that he was nothing more than a third level galley slave for Jesus Christ. That's what he was saying. So you would never get that out of the English term. Why? Because there's a language gap. And so what happens is that since many, many versions, language versions of the Bible have been translated from the English version, and so they carry that error into their languages as well. Not all, but into their language as well. And so we have a language gap, which is why we have this spiritualizing that's going on, okay? And we have this uh, superficial interpretation going on, and we have these people just imposing their point on the text, imposing their point on proper interpretation. And this, and we have, this goes on. Look, let me give you an example. Go to the book of Hebrews. So let's go to Hebrews. And let's look at Hebrews chapter 6. Okay. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. And in fact, and while we're there, let's go to Hebrews chapter 7 as well. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 6. Let's look at the first verse. Okay. Let's look at the first verse. Now, I'm going to recommend a book for you. Okay. I'm going to recommend a book you should have. Okay. Now, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, let's read it. At a, I'm reading again at a New American Standard Version. It says this. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith toward God. God. Do you see that? Okay. Do you see that? Well, now just hold your place in Hebrews 6 1 and go to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. Okay? Um, let's look at this. Now, he says, now. If perfection, if perfection was through through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of its people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not to be designated according to the order of Aaron? Now, when you look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, and you look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11, okay? And this is another example. It's in the book of Hebrews here. So when you look at the word perfection, perfection, because that's the word, okay? Perfection, okay? And you see that in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. The word maturity is the word perfection there. And in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11, the word there is perfection. You can get completely confused, you can get completely confused on how you comprehend Hebrews unless, of course, you understand. Okay? On how uh, you understand that perfection has nothing to do with salvation. Not, okay? It has, not, it has to do that. No, let me put it this way. 
Perfection has to do with salvation. It, it has nothing to do with spiritual maturity. So salvation is one issue. Spiritual maturity is another. Okay, and so, and, and you and you see people who just they just kind of misinterpret it because they took the English word and didn't find out what's behind that English word. Okay, so that's what you'll find out as you study the words and their relationships in the text. Okay, so it's very important for us to do this mm -hmm. and to study the words in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament. Okay. Hey, let me recommend you get this book, W. E. Vines, Vines Dictionary. It's it's the expository dictionary of the New Testament words. Vines expository dictionary of the new of the New Testament words. I would recommend that you get that book. Okay, now it's it, it's helpful for someone who doesn't know the Greek language. And by the way, you don't need to know the Greek language. But you should have this book as a resource. Okay? Now you can look up every single English word and tell, and it will tell you what the Greek meaning of every single English word says. It would be a great help to you as a Bible student. Also, you should get a good concordance. A good concordance will help you in the study of the words.